to you. Well, um, I want to say a couple words about why we would do this in the first place, and then I'm going to give you uh, kind of an official spiel uh, about John Cox's bio, and then I'm going to pray for us and then turn things over to John. Um, why we would do this is we think that uh, growth and, and spiritual formation is important, and we think this particular aspect of our life and our world is important, and so we want to give attention to that, and this will be uh, a new trend you will see at least annually, if not biannually, of doing some sort of conference, uh, seminar, lectures, etc. Topics will vary, but we thought this would be a great one to start with as far as the topic itself and then having John here specifically, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. Two things I want to say about marriage. Uh, one is that most of us just do it. We just, you know, marriage is just something that you just do. And uh, especially if you have kids still at home, um, meta thinking about your relationship happens never. Um, and unless there's a problem and then there's, you know, you're thinking about your relationship then, but that's not necessarily the calmest or best atmosphere to think about your relationship. And if you don't have kids at home, chances are you've been married a long time and uh, pretty solidly in, in cruise control, maybe, um, and not that there's not real blessings and benefits to that. Um, but it, it seems to me no matter where you are in the journey, it's a real blessing and, and a gift uh, to sit and to think outside of like a heated moment uh, with your spouse when you talk about your marriage in that context to do what, what I would refer to as meta-thinking, uh, to think about the grand narrative of what marriage is, what your marriage is, where God has you, what he wants from you uh, even now uh, in your relationship. And so we hope this weekend will be an opportunity to take a deep breath to kind of get outside yourself and your marriage a little bit and peer in at your marriage. Uh, one other thing I'd say about marriage, and I don't, I don't even know if John agrees with this or not, but I think it's a good principle, uh, and I've heard it said before that um, if your marriage is weak and everything else around you, job, everything else is strong and good, uh, you'll move into the world in weakness. But if your marriage is strong and everything else around you is weak, broken and crumbling, it gives you actually the capacity to move into the world with strength. And uh, I think that just really testifies to uh, some of the beauty and the capacity, but also some of the brokenness and the difficulty of marriage, because uh, we would all desire we would all desire to move into the world with strength. And so maybe this will be a weekend uh, where some of the weak spots of your marriage, or maybe your marriage as a whole feels weak, will allow some building of strength for you to be able to traffic and move through the challenges of the world. So John Cox, uh, I've known John at least 10 years, probably 15, been exposed to John primarily uh, through him doing some teaching, leading, instructing within uh, RUF circles, um, been at other conferences with John, like at Redeemer years ago, and uh, so we've developed some good camaraderie. Uh, with each other over the years. I have many uh, friends who have benefited uh, from John's psychotherapy, and he's gracious to be able to uh, engage with that, with, uh, I'm sure, on a very limited basis these days. My guess is he has uh, negative openings uh, in his uh, clinical schedule, but I have good friends that, that uh, have been able to um, meet with him in those ways, and so we have a ton of respect for John, uh, and I also have a ton of trust in John. Marriage is a, is a challenging thing, period, and it's challenging to get somebody to come in and, and that I trust, uh, both in the way they're going to do this, what they're going to say, how they're going to do it, the vibe. I'm sure you've all been to marriage things that um, you might care less for, uh, and I, I, I'm confident that you will be very glad uh, that you're here and that we brought John here with us. John's a clinical psychologist, native of Jackson, Mississippi. His wife's name is Norma, three daughters, 36, 33, 30, four and a half grandkids, uh, deacon emeritus, first prez in Jackson, 
uh, BA from Ole Miss, great institution, Harvard of the South, many people say. Uh, <laughs> master's in marriage and family therapy from RTS, doctorate um, in clinical psychology uh, from Rosemead in California. Uh, currently, he's a clinical psychologist at Live Oak Psychological Associates in Jack Jackson. He's been in clinical practice for 34 years. He's the author of multiple books that you can find outside, but no T-shirts. I told him he needs to increase his merch. Uh, I feel like we need some John Cox vinyl out there, but what we've got <laughs> is John Cox books, and, and I'll help him maybe next time he's here to talk about parenting, uh, which is not this weekend. Uh, we'll get him some vinyl and T-shirts to put on the merch table. Um, apart from his vocation and, and family, he loves to cook and he loves to sail. So I'm going to pray. Father, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Um, we believe, uh, though we might not talk like this often, that this is a divine appointment. You have us here for a reason, and you are here, and we are here, and so we pray that you would show up. We pray that you'd help us to show up. This will be an easy, easy time to not show up uh, and to be distracted. We pray against distractions. We pray against any issues with the kids in this building, at home, etc. and we pray that you would protect this time. And we pray that you would use this time uh, to redeem and to restore and to reform uh, our marriages. And we pray that you would guide and lead John to do that with great precision, discernment, and grace. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Welcome, John. Amen. Thank you. You know, I do these around the country probably one a month, take the summer off. Um, and, I mean, I'm just a human being, right? And I have different vibes, different feelings about different ones. Sometimes I could do a conference, and I'm like, no. Eh. I've been so excited about this one, and I'm so happy to be here. I don't know what that is, a God thing, whatever, but I'm so excited about being here. And uh, I'm also just looking out there, excited to see how many of y'all uh, brought your spouses here for me to change this weekend. Um, it's, y'all, it's going to be so neat, you know, just to watch them grow and, you know, it's, watch the Lord's work in their lives. Something I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way, a distraction I'm going to get out of the way now is I just, um, I'm so old that I've had cataract surgery in the last two weeks. So, I'm, um, I, my glasses, I can see long distance to see up close. I need to move my glasses up. Okay, so I have to go back and forth a lot this weekend until my eyes settle and I get real glasses. That's A, to tell you why I'm going to be doing this all weekend long. B, to tell you that I'm that old. I've been married 41 years and my wife has not tried to kill me, which is my qualification for being here, is that I have, you know, whatever. All right, so welcome to my marriage conference I call Finders Keepers, and I call it that I started calling that a long time ago because I thought, you know, the principles are the same, whether you're married or dating. Um, so it's keepers for you married people. How do we keep our relationship? How do we build it? How do we grow there? And for you finders, seekers, hoping to get married, I want you here learning the principles. We got any singles here? A few? A couple? Whatever? All right. Good. Um... I'm glad you're here because we're, it's not that hard to bring the same principles over, which is why I call it that. My hope is that regardless of um, whether you're married or single, that you will experience this as being a, a little bit different kind of a marriage conference than maybe you've been to before. We're going to skip all. Uh, we're going to skip over the you know the basic easy things that you can get in you know, marriage books or whatever, like, you know, getaway weekends and five meaningful touches and, you know, men are like microwaves and women are like crock pots, you know, and hopefully go a little, you know, deeper than that. <laughs> what I want to talk about instead is think about your life, think about your relationship. You know, those ways in which you're like, um, I want us to be closer, but it doesn't seem like it happens. Or your spouse just says, hey, I have a concern about this. And your spouse's response is like, well, get off my case. And it's like all of a sudden these little things blow up. Or you 
start off talking about car insurance, and three hours later, somebody's like, well, maybe we should just split up. And you're like, whoa, where did that come from, you know? Don't you hate that stuff? Don't you wonder why you do it, and how, how, do, how do we stop that stuff? I want to give you some traction for that. I want to talk to you this weekend. This is not, tomorrow we're going to get real practical in terms of some things, but overall, the whole weekend... Um, I want to go a little bit deeper than that. I want to give you a picture of how marriage works. I'm a psychologist. I do therapy every day. I do what you would think I would do. I have a couch and a pipe and a sweater and, you know, that, all right? And and what I found is I do marriage work or individual work or whatever is the question is, what is going on underneath the marriages that makes us act like such gizmos, okay? Marriages don't grow by us just learning communication skills, okay? I don't care, for, by the way, I don't care why a couple comes to see me. They could be, you know, secretly poisoning each other's soup, but they always say, our problem is communication. And I'm like, no, it, it, actually, it seems like y'all are communicating that you hate each other's guts very well. Thank you very much. It's crystal, you know, crystal. But... Anyway, so I want to teach you where the growth does need to take place. By the way, this is weird because I can see my notes without my glasses, but I can't see y'all's face as well. So if any of y'all's spouse dragged you here, you rest assured that you can be in the back going, and I'm not going to be able to see. So I think, you know, that'll, that'll be good for you. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to talk about marriage, how it works. We're going to do a lot of Q&A. Um, this is my Google Voice number, all right? Now, let me, let me tell you why it's there, because I do parenting conferences, too, and people follow you to the car with parenting questions. You know, you're, like, getting in your car, you know, yeah, okay, you know, and they're, they're still, like, okay. But marriage conferences are a little more dicey because your spouse is still sitting there, and you want to ask, like, what do you do if your spouse is a complete rageful maniac? And he's, like, you know. So what do you do with questions like that, right? So the Google Voice number is for, if you have a more confidential question, you can text it to me. Um, I will want to defer to questions in the group because I love the community interaction. Um, don't ask me questions on the Google that you could ask publicly. Save it for something private. And I will let you know also that just in my experience of doing these, I never get to all the questions. And it always makes me feel so bad. I, I go back and look on Sunday afternoon at these precious questions people have asked on Google. So I'll apologize for that in advance. But I want you to know that we have it. I think it's on your handout too, okay? So Norm and I have been married 41 years almost, and uh, we have three kids, all of whom are grown, and now we have grandchildren. It's actually what, what Brent had is out of date. There are now five of them, not four and a half. They're five, and that's like the greatest thing in the whole world. Um, actually, what I thought we might do, where, where's Brent? He's ducked out. I, I, since he's not here, I can go ahead and do this. I'm going to change our, 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 our focus a little this weekend. We had talked about going into marriage, but basically, the truth is I have about six or 800 pictures of my grandchildren. <laughs> and I thought what we'd do this weekend, y'all, is just go through the pictures and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. You know, we'll do Q&A time. Okay. But, okay, check this out. I'm so excited about this. Okay, hang on. It's going to come. That is my second youngest granddaughter on the Jumbotron at Neyland Stadium. <laughs> I'm like, so John, how do you win your audience immediately? Like, I'm in the club now, man. She's got a T on her face. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm very proud of that, and now I'm in the club, am I not? All right, so regarding my family life, I'm sure that you think that my speaking on marriage began by my wife saying something like, oh, honey, you make marriage so blissful. You've got to go on the road and share your secrets, you know. <laughs> Other wives are missing out. The husbands don't know. You know, I promise you that is not the way it happened. I think she's actually, um, 
you know, giving up believing I'm actually going to do any of this stuff, right? Um, I'm as big a knuckleheaded husband as the rest of y'all, and you're going to hear a lot of stories about that from me this weekend, so my professional credentials are going to kind of have to be, you know, what we hang on, um, but it's just not going to sound that way, because speakers always sound like they're really good at what they speak on, right? But, you know, actually, um, Norma used to travel with me more, and we're empty nesters, and we see each other constantly now, so now it's like, nah. But um, people are like, do you bring Norma? I'm like, no, I see Norma every day. Um, <laughs> But Norma was at a conference, and this woman literally comes up to her at the conference and after the conference and goes, oh, what must it be like to be married to him? And, and Norma said, tactfully, I think, she goes, oh, you have no idea. Okay? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. That's, you know, all you do with it. All right. So let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and start this conference out by going ahead and telling you what is the biggest problem in marriage, all right? The real reason that all of us struggle, I'm going to get that out of the way, not build a bunch of suspense. You're not going to have to wait for it. No tantalizing buildup. But I want to tell you what the problem is. I'm going to begin that by reminding you what I do every day is couch, pipe, sweater. I do therapy. I do therapy with adults primarily, um, depression, anxiety, um, destructive behaviors, and of course, a lot of marriages. Now, I don't know if, if, if y'all have been to therapy or not. Most of us have at some point or another, but most of us don't go to therapy just for kicks, right? It's not like, yeah, my family used to always go to therapy every summer, so I thought, you know, it should be fun to... No. We go to therapy because we have a symptom. We have a problem. We have, a, we have an owie, okay? We have a boo-boo. In other words, depression, anxiety, OCD, bipolar, eating disorder, pick a card, any card. Now, here's where we're going with that. Here's the secret. Uh, there's a backstory to that. People don't get symptoms or problems just because they're lazy or stupid or have a chemical imbalance or they have sin problems or don't have good theology or whatever like that. The real reason people have psychological problems or marital issues is what's actually happening is this. And it's one of the secrets of the universe. That doing life well, doing relationships well, doing your job well, doing marriage well, requires what I call certain emotional, relational abilities, kind of in our software, all right? What a psychologist calls character. In other words, when a psychologist talks about character, we don't mean like, he's a real character, or he's a man of character. What we mean by character is the collection of abilities that humans need in order to make life work, okay? In other words, God made us in such a way that to do life and to do relationships and to be functional and to have friends or to have a job or to be married or be a parent, for heaven's sakes, we have to have a lot of abilities in our innards in order to do that, all right? And if we were missing some of those abilities, it's sort of like that those times when you, when you find a file on your computer and you double-click it, it comes up and goes, pick which program to open this file because it doesn't know what to do with it, okay? That happens in our marriages. So, we have to have these abilities to make life work or to manage our emotional world or to manage relationships. And we ain't born with them, and we develop them in relationships. And here's the plot point that's going to begin this conference and begin the different way I want you to begin thinking about your marriage, and that is this. We have to have these abilities God made us to. And we're all missing some of them, okay? In other words, you could say that functioning as a person in relationships, in your work, in your life, whatever, is kind of like being a car. A car has to be able to do lots of things in order to work right. Correct. It has to be able to go, and it has to be able to stop, and it has to be able to turn, and the doors have to open and close. And in the South, it needs an air conditioner. And two weeks ago, it needed tire chains. Okay, so <laughs> let's go with the tire chains analogy. How's that car going to work if it's missing the tire chains? Well, it's just fine until there's a foot of snow on the ground, and all of a sudden, you're trying to stop, and you pump, 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 pump the brakes, and your car doesn't stop. And you go plowing into that Kia Soul in front of you. Why? 
Weren't you trying real hard to not hit them? Weren't you trying and hoping that you wouldn't do this again? Maybe you prayed real hard about it, but we're missing the tire change. We're missing brakes. We're missing some piece of what a car needs to have. Humans are the same way. And when someone comes to me for depression or anxiety or whatever, one of the things I'm looking for is not like, oh, how do we stop your depression? It's what might be missing for you there. What we're going to do with marriage is expand that there. What do we need to make marriage work? How might you be able to sort of assess where do I have those abilities? Where might I be lacking? How about my spouse, or my boyfriend, whatever? And, and begin seeing that that is actually the real problem in your marriage. All right? So, what are the brakes, steering wheels, tire chains for human beings? You get married. Did that person develop the ability in their software, in their character, in their heart? Did they learn to be emotionally close? Did they learn what it means to share their heart and be known? Or is it after the honeymoon, it's kind of me and my best friend, the remote control, okay? And you're married to them and you go, golly, they're so disconnected and I feel like there's no intimacy. Maybe they don't care about me. Or you're married to little Miss Bottomliner who just gets things done and you go, she doesn't even care about my heart. Is that it? Or maybe they're missing an ability that they need to develop, that they have an injury there that they're missing. Maybe they weren't taught that. Maybe it's software they're missing that we can learn. That's what I do for a living. We can learn it. Maybe it's an issue about destructive behaviors. Maybe they can't say no to their own destructive choices. Can they set limits on their impulses? Do they drink too much or yell too much or porn too much or gossip too much, okay? In other words, can they set limits on themselves? That's an ability we have to be taught. Can they manage difficult people in their life? Can they stand up to their boss or to the plumber or to their bossy spouse? Or do they live in that kind of one-down anxiety child position in the world where other people feel scary and like you've got to please them all the time? That's software. Did they make sense of, did they learn, did they get the app for what it feels like and looks like to be forgiven, to be imperfect? Did they develop the ability to, have to, 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 to not have to be perfect in order to feel safe? Did I develop the ability to stand up here with my glasses going on and off and not feel ashamed and embarrassed? Oh my gosh, I bet they think I'm an idiot. Did I develop the ability to feel forgiveness and safety and grace? That's an ability, all right? Now, these examples reflect things we have to do in order to do life. And here's the secret, I will say it again. I don't know if you've been keeping up with current events, but marriage requires all of those skills, and all of us are missing some of them. And this weekend, we're not going to talk about how you can like learn your spouse's love language better. I want to talk about what goes on in human beings that makes them able to do relationships better or worse, and where we might have blind spots there. Because if what I do in my office for, I've been doing marriage therapy longer than I've been in practice, 40-something years. I was doing marriage therapy before I was married. Trust me, it was good stuff, y'all. Okay? I was really an impressive therapist at 22 years old. Yeah. Anyway, so, so, so here's our point. The biggest problem in marriage is you take two incomplete, sinful, screwed up, real-life people who are living in the same house together and they're both missing some of these character abilities that we absolutely have to have to make relationships work. And if we don't have them, it don't work right. And they start enc encountering the challenges that marriage absolutely requires, like to be intimate or to resolve conflict or to forgive injuries or to push back on sin in me or in you. And guess what? They push that brake pedal and nothing happens. Pump pump, pump, and, that, and they, all of a sudden they're having the same fight again, or they're having the same distance again, or you singles the same breakup again. And again, here's the key, even though you don't want to be having it, neither one of you wants to fight in your marriage. Neither one of you wants to be alone in your marriage. Maybe even you've prayed real hard, but you're missing the brake pedal. What are those brake pedals? 
So here's my, my point. We all come to marriage, this place that we've been told is, you know, the, where I'll last find my fulfillment and joy, or you singles, you know, you, you're, you're not happy because you're not married. <laughs> I, th- I spoke to some singles once, and I began by going, let me get this straight. You guys are unhappy because you're not married? You know, anyway, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. And you come to marriage, and, and marriage requires all these abilities, but you're both missing these abilities, so things don't get done, so you have marriage problems. And you go, ugh, I knew I should have married that bass player. But the problem's not with your marriage. The problem is with your software. The problem is that we're both lacking some of the abilities we need to do marriage well. And we can fix that. I just want you fixing the right thing. All right? So, the real problem in marriage is that it requires all these abilities, and we all have missing pieces. So, we get into the relationship, and those missing pieces start going back and forth. And that's what we're going to unpack. Now, this is good news, and it's bad news. The good news is, no one's the bad guy. In other words, This is not about, oh my gosh, I married the wrong person. You're a horrible spouse. No, you're both incomplete. You're both missing some pieces. Good news is nobody's the bad guy. Bad news is you're both screwed up. (laughs) Okay? In other words, you're both incomplete. You're both missing brake pedals. You're both coming to marriage without some of the software you need to do it. You're both part of the problems that are going on there, but you're not bad guys. You're incomplete guys, okay? Like I told a couple a while back who were contemplating a divorce, I said, actually, you're talking about trading in this car. The problem is actually not with the car. The problem is you're both bad drivers. In other words, what you need is not a new car. You need driver's ed, you know? That's what this is, kind of. So point one in John's marriage conference is, the, 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 the problem is not your marriage. The problem is that we're all lear- lacking some of the abilities that we need to make marriage work, and we're going to talk about what they are, and we're going to talk about how you grow there, okay? So here's the correct question, and the question that I believe changes marriages. I want you to both start asking, hey, how can I start like growing in my heart to do married stuff better with you, honey? How do we start looking at this not as, I can't believe you're such a, but instead of that, I'm really missing this kind of stuff, and you're missing this kind of stuff, I think I see what Cox is saying. You want to grow? Instead of playing who's the bad guy hot potato for the rest of your life? What do we need in our software? Let's learn them together. In other words, before we have a marriage conference, we kind of have to have a you conference, all right? I thought about calling this conference Becoming the Kind of Spouse You're Hoping Yours Was, (laughs) but I think the grammar is bad. But (laughs) now, another two things. Thinking this way is going to give us two really really nice things. Number one, it's going to help stop the blame. And we got to talk about that for just a second. Most marriages become what I call blame marriages. In other words, number one thing I see in my office when a couple comes to see me is they have a problem, and maybe it's that the kids are this or the in-laws are that or sex is this or the money is that, but what they do is they don't ever actually address the problem and engage solving it because they get lost in blaming each other for whose fault it was. Think about it. Isn't that what you do? Well, I wouldn't have said that if you hadn't said so-and-so. I did not say so-and-so. Yes, you did. We talked about this. No, we didn't. And, and you're basically saying, who's the bad guy, right? And I'm sitting over there going like, wow, like y'all aren't getting anywhere. And at some point, is one of you going to admit to being the bad guy? I mean, I see two bad guys here. Actually, three, because I'm in the room too, all right? I call that he language and she language. And you'll hear me say that a lot this weekend. It's like couples come in, or individuals especially, when their spouse is not there, and they're you don't believe what she said to me yesterday, you know, and there's he language, okay? And by the way, while they're doing all this blame stuff, old Mr. Problem, which they actually need to solve, 
he's sitting over there all by himself and nobody's even paying any attention to him, you know, and, and he never gets solved because they're too busy fighting over who the bad guy is, right? That's why you've been having the same fight since college, okay? So our default is blame. And I want you to bookmark that and notice that and notice how much is a theme in your marriage and notice how what we're talking about second in this conference is what we do with blame because it is one of the primary obstacles to you ever growing and moving anywhere in your marriage because it's so ingrained in us. We learned it from our beloved mother and father, Adam and Eve. This is in my sermon Sunday too. Think about it. What did they do when they sinned? They ate the tree. They started hiding. God comes and asks Adam, who told you you were naked? What does Adam do? He does what any self-respecting husband would do. He blames his wife, right? But actually, he blames God and his wife in one sentence. The woman whom you gave to me gave me the fruit. And, I mean, that's a two for man. Like in this, and I'm thinking this is really impressive in your first day as a sinner. I mean, this is some, this guy's a natural. I mean, he's taken right to this. Two for one, shame fest, blame boy. Yeah. Anyway, like hitting a double as a rookie in the big leagues. But, you know. Now, in case you had not noticed in your mirrors, this blame thing does not get you very far. And it never solves the problem. And it won't get you much fulfillment in your marriage. Unless your spouse is very pathological in a different way, they rarely go, you're right, I'm the bad one. Okay? So, instead of blame, what I want to start creating for you tonight in big picture form and a little more detailed uh, focus tomorrow is marriages in which we begin, like the gospel, marriages that begin with an orientation not toward blame, not toward judgment. In other words, look what we're doing here. We're looking at marriage and trying to solve the dynamics of it in the same way that God looks at his relationship with us and to solve the dynamics of that broken relationship. What has to happen first is the law. The blame has to get addressed. The first place we're going to go is a position where we say, you know what? We're wasting our time blaming. We are wasting our time pointing the finger. We're wasting our time going, what were you thinking? We both need grace. We are both the problem. Our junk, the stuff that Cox is talking about, that software, the things we're going to talk about tonight and tomorrow, that's the bad guy, not you and me. All right? Let's quit the condemnation and recognize the problem is not that you're the bad one. It's that we're both fallen, that we're both incomplete. And software is, is our problem, not who's the bad guy, all right? This kind of little kid junk, which is what we're talking about in a sense, this like incomplete inner six-year-old that we all have is really the problem. Let me, I'm going to draw you something that I, I, um, I tell couples in my office. Okay. Okay, here's the secret. There's actually four people in every marriage. There's you and there's her, and there's little her, and there's little you, all right? So now the truth is you guys probably get along okay, you know? The problem is these little guys. And so, husband, you come in from work, and you smell meatloaf, and you go, meatloaf again? No harm, no foul, right? But she's not the one who hears it. Little her hears it. Like, really? Does he not understand how hard I've worked? Oh, and the first thing he says is he walks in the house criticizing. And so, big her, she's on Neptune, man. Little her is now the one, you know, trying to stir the pot, you know, from what, because she's this tall. Anyway, um... And she says, well, if you don't like it, you can come in here and cook it yourself. But big you doesn't hear that. Little you does. Oh, my gosh, she doesn't appreciate how hard I work every day taking care of our family. And y'all are off to the races, right? That's my point. In other words, what we're going to figure out and understand is what goes on with these guys, okay? Now, let me tell you a funny story that happened to me once the first time I did this. Uh, 
Fortunately, it was on a blackboard, and it wasn't eight feet tall. But the first time I ever did this, I wasn't thinking, and I used circles. And so all of a sudden, I had a, a giant eighth-grade boy joke on the screen, okay? So these are squares. Do you hear me? The recording, whatever, they're squares, all right? The video, all right. That's what I want you to get. Right, come back, baby. Yes. All right. So one thing that you have in common, I don't care what you say, you know, those couples say, we have nothing in common. I'm like, well, actually, you do have in common that you're both unhappy and you want to stop being unhappy, that you're both hurting and you want the hurt to stop, you know? In that sense, you guys are same and samesies, all right? Besties. You do have that in common, Okay. So step one is, do you hear where I'm going with this? I'm wanting to make it safe to be fallen. The problem in your marriage is not that your spouse is a jerk, and boy, if only they change. The problem is, I want to put you on equal footing. Both of you are broken and incomplete, just like me, which is why you hear stories about my own screw-ups here. I want us to stop going to the blame. I want to make it safe to be fallen. I want to begin like the gospel where the first step is, I'm a mess and so are you. Let's be screwed up together, okay? Our marriages have to begin the same way our relationship with God begins. This is a gospel-centered marriage, I think. It begins with let's get rid of the blame, all right? I think that's Christianity, and I think that's a good marriage. That's where we're going. Now, number two, gospel doesn't stop with grace. It says we're safe to be fallen, you know, like the typical psychobabble shrink, like you're all screwed up and sinful and hurtful and you're, a, you're crazy as a road lizard, but it's okay. It's okay to be. It's not okay. You can look at the cross and see it's not okay. I'll tell you what it is. It's safe. It is not okay to be hurtful. It is not okay to be screwed up, but it's safe now because of him. And I want your marriage to be a place where it's safe. Is it okay when you hurt your spouse? No. But can we make it safe? And can we make you safe to her or her to you? And can we make it safe for you to be able to say, you know what, I really screwed up. Isn't that a safe thing to say? Rather than not me screwing up, it was you. Which is where we live. You see where we're beginning with the blame issue? Why we're beginning with the blame issue? The issue of grace, the issue of safety has to be where we start. But that's not where the, that's not where the gospel ends. It's like, great, cool, you're safe. You're loved. How about now we grow? How about it? Let's become like Jesus. How about it? And that's where we're going this weekend. All right? In other words, I want to talk about what's broken. I want to talk about my blind spots, your blind spots. I want us to grow together, not as enemies, but as broken, fallen friends. That's the marriage I want you to leave here with. Hey, we're a mess, honey, aren't we? You want to grow together instead of being like blaming each other? Not a blame marriage, what I call a growth marriage. Hey, we're incomplete, aren't we? Let's let Cox help us grow. All right? That's a good marriage. So, let's get busy. What do we need to have ticking inside of us to, in those cars? What do we need to have characterologically and relationally and, 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 and spiritually and emotionally to be married well, to do life well, to serve God well, to have a relationship well? I want to talk through them real quick right now, and then I'm going to go through them all four tonight. We're going to go through two of them, take a break, come back and look at two more because I want you to have the big picture. Friday night I'm going to push you because it's vital that you have the whole picture. Then we're going to look at two of them in more detail tomorrow morning, all right? And I want you both thinking as I recite them, huh, could this be one of my blind spots? And I want you singles thinking, huh, can I do this in my relationship with my girlfriend? Huh, okay. By the way, singles, um, the more you grow, the more categories you have for what healthy looks like, the better picker you're going to be for a spouse, okay? And I don't know why this is so, but it's a psychological truism. We tend to marry people of about the same level of psychopathology as ourselves. So when you look at your spouse and go, oh my gosh, you're like a four-year-old. Okay. All right. <laughs> All 
All right, so I call them the four eyes until I think of a catchier name. I'm going to do like a lottery, a, a pass the hat. I need a catchier name because I want to do a marriage book. I don't like this ultimately. I think we need something cooler than that. Um, four eyes. They are the software package to do marriage. You know how they say there's no I in team? Well, there is in marriage. Like Mississippi, there's four of them, okay? <laughs> and they are about intimacy and closeness and connection. We're going to talk about that one first. They're about identity. There's more to marriage than just closeness. There's also how do I make sense of my sense of self and yours. There's the issue of imperfection. How do I make sense of all the ways you make me unhappy? Because I know that living with me is a club med experience. Um, and impulse control, and that is uh, how do I manage my emotional world? Okay? Everybody... Everybody good? Let's rock and roll. Intimacy. In other words, relational closeness, attachment, um, connection. God calls them abiding, knowing. 1 Corinthians 13, you know, 1 John 3. God's very big on this one, the connection, abiding thing, Okay. This is going to be a whole talk tomorrow. We're going to unpack the dynamic of what intimacy is and what it's not tomorrow morning. Uh, but let's look at it briefly. We're going to need to go to two ways with intimacy. This is vital. Um, we actually are going to need to go two ways with all of these. Um, and let's look at them. Number one, can I let you in? Think about what we usually talk about when we chit-chat. We go to news, sports, and weather. You know, I chatted with many of y'all uh, before we started. What did we talk about? Can't believe there was a foot of snow. Uh, can you believe those vols? Um, you know, how's your mama and them? In other words, one of the things we talk about sometimes is just chit-chat, news, sports, and weather, and that's legit. We'll talk about that. Other thing we talk about sometimes is sort of problem-solving opinions. Um, well, I think it would help you if you watched your carbs. Guys, don't say that to your wives. Okay, let's just go ahead and... Pencil that in your to-do list, all right? But this is opinion. Should we remodel or should we build? Um, should, we, should we get a used car or a new car? I think season two of The Mandalorian is the best. In other words, it's the things you have opinions about, all right? Now, these are valid. All of these are valid. And solving problems is valid. You know, we're not like building a commune here. But we also need to address the issue of intimacy because if that's all you can do, is news, sports, and weather, and give opinions and solve problems, if that's the deepest you can go, then you're not going to ever really know who I am. I won't be able to be close to you. And here's where we slide over into defining intimacy. Because another thing that we talk about, besides these problem-solvings or chit-chat, is we th say things like, I have a meeting tomorrow, and I'm actually kind of scared about it. Or... I don't know what's going on, but I've been feeling really lonely from God. Or I'm really ashamed about what I said last night. Um, what, was the, what was the Instagram meme I saw the other day? I don't think before I speak. I think after I speak. For hours in the middle of the night. On and on. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, what are these things that I'm sharing? They sound more emotional, right? In other words, what they are is the truth about my heart, okay? Let me see. Yeah, okay. I was wondering if we're going to talk about this tomorrow or now. We're talking about it now. This is an important cock secret of the galactic empire, okay? And that is that facts are great. They're the truth about my head. Feelings are going to give you more the truth about my heart. And one of, the, one of the pieces of software we have to have in order to do relationship well and to do intimacy and connection, whether it's with your spouse or your children or with your God, is the ability to connect with what it feels like to be in a relationship with you and what it feels like to be me and talk to you about it, okay? I'm not shucking and jiving anymore. I'm not, hey, yeah, I'm fine, whatever. We're telling the truth about my heart. Okay? So, what we feel, which we will say tomorrow is a lousy way to determine the truth about reality, whether I feel like that truck's going to hit me or not, doesn't have a lot of import, but it's mainline to being close and connected. So, can I let you in? 
is the first part of intimacy. Can I, did I learn, was I taught the ability, did my car develop the ability? And it is an ability to know what it feels like to be me. Some people don't know. To share what it feels like to be me, to speak it, and to care what it feels like to be you. Okay? That's all intimacy is, guys. It's not rocket surgery, right? So for a marriage to be meaningful, we have to be able to kind of go below the surface and let you in. Otherwise, your marriage is going to be, it's going to have all the, the emotional animation of a, of a dragnet rerun. Who got that reference? Who knows what I'm talking about? Anybody else? You older people, y'all know. All right, y'all may not... See, one of my problems with, with public speaking now is I'm 63 years old, and I'm losing my audience because more and more I'm telling jokes and people don't get them. Y'all know Andy Griffith, though, right? Okay, good. Okay, I ran to a great Andy Griffith the other day. We're going to take a little break and read Andy Griffith. All right, you ready? The reason Mayberry was so peaceful and quiet was because nobody was married. Andy, Aunt B, Barney, Floyd, Howard, Goober, Gomer, Sam, Ernest T. Bass, Helen, Thelma Lou, Clara, and of course Opie, were all single. The only married person was Otis, and he stayed drunk all the time. <laughs> so, would you stand please for the benediction? I think we can close in prayer. So, hearts, part of let you in means, can, does my heart have a category, not just to share facts, but to be able to say things like, I'm hurting, or I'm proud of you for what you did at work, or I can see that you're exhausted. Do you hear the feelings communicated there? We're going to talk about how feelings are important there tomorrow, but do you hear the heart communicated there? You're getting me, okay? Um, let's use right now as an example. Do you feel like I'm present with you? Are you feeling like I'm into this? Why? Because who I am emotionally is very present here, right? I'm playing, I'm, gro I'm goofing up, I'm, I'm laughing with y'all, I'm getting serious. You can feel that my emotional range is going around, and you feel that, right? In other words, you're feeling a connection of intimacy, all right? I want you to have a category for that, all right? God's real into this. He calls it abiding. He calls it knowing in that Hebrew sense. He expresses its absence by saying things like, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Your spouse ever say that to you? <laughs> so, if you want your marriage to grow, part one of part one is to be asking, how much did I develop this ability? How much, could this be one of my blind spots? Was my family one of those places where it was like, I was talking to a guy yesterday, and in his family, everything was logical and rational and left brain and how you felt about things was just not in the picture. He just literally doesn't know. And he's not a mean guy, but it's like, it's like, he, it's like the, 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 the nerve endings are busted. He can't feel it, all right? Are we missing that piece? So now when your spouse goes, oh my gosh, you know, living with you is like living with a robot. All right, that sounds like an attack and they are attacking you, but maybe it's not because you're a jerk. Maybe you're missing this piece. That's grace. That's safety. You're fallen. You're not bad. I want to make it safe to say, yeah, I am missing that piece. I, I want you and my body of Christ people to help me grow there. All right? But our bottom line is this. The problem in our marriage is not that you married the wrong person or you have a bad marriage. It's that your software might be lacking this ability. Okay? Now, at this point in the show... Those of you who are relational, connecty, touchy-feely types like me are going, man, this is awesome. This is why I brought him. Like, this is what I was hoping we'd talk about. Like, Brent, God, this is awesome. Okay? And you're po poking him, making sure he's paying attention, you know. And you bottom liners are going, oh, God, great. It's another one of those, like, we're going to break up the small groups next. And you have to share our feelings. You know, this is a nightmare. <laughs> but the truth is this guys you know norman and i are backwards all right 
Um, you know, men are from men are from Mars, women are from Venus. All right, we're backwards. Norma's from Mars, and I'm from Venus. Okay, I'm the one going like, well, why can't you just like turn off the Taylor Swift game and talk to me? You know, it's like I want to I want to interact, I want to feel, you know, I want to I want to be connected and emotional. And she's like, yeah, okay, you know. And I'm like, well, what'd you get married for if you don't want to have emotions? You know, that's me, okay? So guys get a lot of hassle for this, but, uh, you know, it's not always that way, okay? So for those of us who are the relational types, actually, it's a good thing I'm relational because it kind of comes in handy in my job, right? Um, for us relational types, intimacy means something else. Okay, great, yeah. Those people who aren't so in touch with their emotional world and don't connect so well, they need to listen to the first part of Cox's little lecture on how it's important to access who we are emotionally and bring that. But for those of us connector types, our question is this, have I developed the ability, was I taught in my software to feel love and connected inside and to hold on to love, even if it's not being shared right now? How good am I at that? In other words, can I keep you in? All right? A legitimate problem with us relator types, and you don't hear this at many marriage conferences, which is the reason I do a different kind of marriage conference, is that us relator types can leave, live our life kind of needing to connect all the time and share all the time and be listened to all the time and, you know, sit knee to knee all the time and be close. And if we don't, it's like, oh, we have marriage problems. Okay? Instead, keep you in, ask this question. It says, can I sometimes feel good just being me and know that you love me and be grounded in that? Grounded in my sense of self, grounded in God, grounded in my body of Christ people, even if you are watching the Taylor Swift game, okay? So I, was, I worked with him a couple of years back, and, and he was kind of this insecure guy. This is a little bit of an extreme, but you see it a lot. He was, he was always needing reassurance that she loved him. And she'd be distracted doing something. She was obviously, he was very kind of insecure and needful of connection. So you can imagine what she was like. She was like a no cry babies bumper sticker on her car, right? All right. So he would just, you know, haphazardly say, I love you. Which she heard just like you did. Not as a man declaring his love for the woman of his, no, no, this is his guy. Sort of like, will you tell me one more time that you love? Okay which repelled her, all right? So, of course, she did need to look at what goes on with her about being connected because she was kind of a, a left brain bottom line, all right? But my question for him is, dude, what's going on in you that needs to get all this reassurance? Can you hold on to love? Can you keep her in, all right? Now, hear me on this, boys and girls. This difficulty with holding on to connection and love is as big of a problem with intimacy in marriages as that robot spouse who can't connect. Shall I say it again? My difficulty holding on to love and being grounded and knowing that you love me, even if we aren't sharing knee to knee and connecting and all that, my insecurity there, my need for more connection, my anxiety that we aren't close enough, is as big of a problem regarding intimacy in a marriage as that spouse who can't connect at all. Okay? That's why I say this is, in my opinion, an unusual thing that usually isn't talked about in marriage conferences. Because marriage conferences, what you usually hear is, y'all need to be sharing. And that's exactly one half the truth. The other half is, what do you do with the sharing when you give? Huh? That is just as big a deal. Because if you're not careful, fellow connector relator types, our needfulness, our lo longing, our delight and connection can come across as needy or demanding or insatiable to our spouse, and guess where they're going to go? G sector, man, they're out of here. They're going to pull away, which is the last thing we want, and what will happen is we'll start a dance. And we'll talk tomorrow about dances because that's a huge part of the dynamic of marriages, okay? So see where we're going? These are character abilities that we have to be taught in relationship and all of us are missing some of them. Can I reach out and share? Can I, can I be grounded in trust and not be needy, okay? And you can start to see how that might be affecting your marriage, all right? That's what's behind our marriage problems, I think, 
Man, I forgot to do all this. Right. Y'all, y'all heard me say all that, right? Okay. That's what's behind our marriage problems, not that you like married the wrong person, okay? By the way, what happens when I can't let you in goes out on a blind date with I can't keep you in? It's love at first sight. You know, all I want is connection. And the other one goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's like, ah! You know, it's, you know, cue the theme of love story. You know, that's every marriage that there is. Um, another, by the way, these are on a continuum practically. I mean, nobody's either one or the other, but we do tend toward one side or the other. And I want you to have the categories, okay? Now, if you struggle here, which you do, all right, that's, that's cool in the game, all right? You're falling. Welcome to the club. I want you now to bring that to your spouse. It's a great topic for date night. I want you to be able to say, hey, you know that can't let you in thing Cox was talking about? That's what you've been trying to tell me, right? And that can't keep you in? That kind of rang a bell for me. You want to grow there? I want this to be something that you can talk about because neither one of you are going to do this well. All right? Second eye. Identity. In other words, <clears throat> dude, we're doing good. We're going to do this one, and we'll take a break, and we'll come back and do the next two, and then we will do Q&A till the, till the cows come home. All right, identity. This one's about separateness. This one's about boundaries. This is about even though you're one, there's still two people involved, okay? This is that there's more to relationship than just attachment. There's more to the relationship than just, you know, candlelight and bath soaps and Adele music, okay? There's also the dynamic of individual separateness, power, all right? And again, this one has two sides. Can I be me? And can I make room for, can I let you be you? In other words, can we both matter here? Now, this could be a whole talk. But what we're, where we are right now, if we kind of freeze-framed it, in a sense, is one of the most important dynamics in anything and everything, be it parenting or relationship with God or whatever. And that is, you could say that the two biggest parts of relationship are closeness and mutuality, closeness and separateness, uh, warmth and tenderness and power. Um, we're talking about these two aspects of relationship. Think about parenting. In the book, I talk a lot about love and limits. Uh, God talks about this a lot. Um, peace and righteousness, um, grace and truth. Uh, Mary and Martha, he's really big on this balance of the connection piece with the power and strength and, and authority piece. So he, so he says, um, I'm the Lord your God who led you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What a nice guy. That's a lot of intimacy and connection. Next line. You shall have no other gods before me, and you hear his power, all right? And our culture's tried to defang God. Let's just make him meek and all that. No, his power is this incredible force that creates the context for good. But I'm going to get way off topic there. All right. So this is going to be huge for us tomorrow because our second talk tomorrow is essentially going to be developing this identity piece. We're going to talk about conflict. What do you do with conflict? What do you do with a fight? I want to get real practical. I want to deconstruct fighting. I want to give you some frontal lobe tools to deal with the explosive nature of what fights can be. But obviously, if I'm going to be me and you're going to be you, we're going to have conflict, right? I mean, if you don't ever have conflict, then one of you is unnecessary, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> So, let's look at them. Number one, can I be me? This is the ability, and it is an ability that we have to learn. And when people don't have it, part of my job in therapy is not to help you with anxiety. It's to help you develop a sense of me, because that's what's underneath it. Um, did I develop the ability to know who I am, what I value, what I want? Can I have my ideas and you have yours? Can I say no and not be terrified? Can I be close to you but also different from you? You know those people 
and half of you are those people who are kind of struggle with being themselves and being me in a relationship if other people aren't going to like me, right? And, and they, never, they don't ever want to pick a restaurant. Like, oh, we respond, you know, like that. And they can kind of live actually controlled by their spouse or other people, sometimes their children, because they're still living technically in what a shrink would call a compliant child position. I'm not living as this is who I am. I'm living down as, oh, I'm kind of scared about what you're going to think about me, okay? So can I be me? Did I learn that that was a safe thing to do? Do I know who me is? I had a client the other day who was saying, you know, if I get all the shame out of the way and have always been a good boy or a good girl out of the way, I'm not really sure who I would be. And I'm like, well, then let's, let's start asking. So anyway, to those of you who might struggle with can I be me, to you I say, in order to make marriage work or your job or parenting for heaven's sakes, we need the ability to have a seat at the table in our relationships. We need the ability to have a voice, all right? You can actually, one of the things that we can talk about in a parenting conference one day or in the book or whatever is that, well, I'll ask you, where's the first place you start seeing a child's real voice start to, to appear? What age? Huh? Yeah, two, three, right. They're called the terrible twos because all of a sudden we got, you know, a villain living in the house. And, and they like saying no. You know, mine, even my grandchildren now, it's like they like saying no so much. You're like, you want a piece of candy? Like, no. And they take it anyway. They just want to say no, you know? One of ours is more operatic. It's not like no. It's like, no. You know, it's, it's pitch to it, you know? Anyway, children do need to learn to say no. I was raised in the children are seen and not heard generation, and so I had some repair work to do, okay? Um, our culture has moved a little to the other end where it's now it's the parents who are seen and not heard. Um, <laughs> um, our children need to learn to develop the, the, the ability to hear no when their parents say it, but they're also trying to make sense of the say no piece. Okay, and we can talk about that in a parenting context. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but we start to develop the sense of what do I want, who am I, you know, what do I believe, a sense of self. I see people all the time in my office who come to see me with that he language, that she language, and they have a lot to say to me about, you know, what a jerk their spouse is and how their spouse is always telling them how to drive and how to spend the money and goes off on them if they're you know, not doing what they want and blah, 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 blah. And I'm, you know, that's all bad and everything, right? But I always ask as they're doing this he language, she language, whatever, hey, you know, what if instead of complying with them or being afraid of upsetting them all the time or doing their bidding and then resenting it later, what if you said to them, you know what, look, I'll discuss. I see this really differently than you, though. And I'm not really willing to get in a fight about it but what you want matters, but what I want matters too, okay? In other words, I say this to them, and this is kind of a brain teaser, what would your marriage be like if it had two people in it? I mean, you might end up with the best marriage in Knox County if it had you in it, you know? <laughs> and they say, well, I, I tell you exactly what she would say, or they'd get real mad and they're living their whole life oriented about what this other person's going to do rather than asking this question of, did I develop the ability to kind of have a me and let that be present in the relationship? And one of the things we'll talk about tomorrow is there's two sides of it. I need to matter and so do you. That's what we call mutuality, which is as important as intimacy. But step one for you doormats is, did I learn to be me? That could be a problem in your marriage, okay? In fact... Let me go way out on a limb and start sawing. That doormat thing of I'm going to live in this compliant position to my spouse always and their voice is the only one that exists and matters, that harms marriages just as much as bully jerks do. I see it constantly in my office. Sometimes the only thing that helps a marriage is for somebody to develop more of a sense of self. I'll talk about that in just a minute. This is not selfishness, by the way, all right? Biblically speaking, this is stewardship. In other words, God calls us to sort of put our finger on our pulse and go, who am I? What do I value? What am I going to do with the gifts I have? 
This is, this is Martin Luther saying, here I stand, I can do no other. This is Joshua when, it, Joshua when he leads the people in the promised land, and what does he say? He says, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. As for me and my family, we'll serve Yahweh, but, you know, there's a lot of gods in Canaan, whatever. But, but, but his point is, do your finger on your pulse and ask, who are you going to serve? Who's your ye? What is your ye going to do? Do you have a ye? That's what this one's about. What do I choose? What do I value? Okay? So a lot of people don't know who they are or are too afraid to have a me in the relationship, and that creates an enormous amount of havoc in their marriages, and they'll say, ooh, I have a bad marriage, but the truth is maybe their marriage is missing some pieces, like them. Okay? You see what we're doing? I told you we were going to do this when we started. I want to dissect marriage. I want to dissect the pieces that make relationships work. The ability to let you in, the ability to keep you in, the ability to have a sense of me. These are the pieces that we need, and I want you to have them forever because they are what are behind your marriage struggles, okay? By the way, another version of the doormat, of the um, can't be me thing that I just got to touch on is passivity. Um, passivity is that dynamic that a lot of people are married to passive spouses. And it's a difficulty because passivity is where I don't actually initiate and act out of what I believe or any responsibility for bringing something to the table. So what? So my spouse is always having to be the one to create the initiation, to remind me to call the plumber or to ask if we paid that bill or to initiate after that fight. Okay, Passivity means I'm kind of absent unless you drag me out. All right. Now, this will make your spouse crazy, you passive people, which is why I mention it, because it puts them in a funny double bind. Think about their double bind. If you're passive and they don't do anything, guess what? Nothing's going to happen. If you're passive and they swoop in and create some initiative and make something happen, great, something's happened now, but because they initiate it and they're enabling you to be passive and it keeps the system going forever. So, if you're passive, you might want to look at that. Which would take initiative, which is the, the exact thing you don't have, which is why passivity is hard to fix. So, anyway. All right, can I be me? Part two, can I let you be you? Or is this just all about me? I know who I am. You don't like it, there's the door. All right, what happens when these two people meet? They get married, right? You getting the theme here? <laughs> so the next question is, can I make room for, can I let you be you, or is this all about me, 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 okay? In other words, the can't be me people have trouble saying that. The can't let you exist people have trouble hearing that. They want to run everything. This is the spiritual dynamic of mutual submission. This is, did I learn the ability to bend the knee to someone else besides myself? Can I have the humility to hear someone call me out and let that in? Or, or, and, and can I hear someone disagree with me? All right? I had a couple of while back, and any time his wife disagreed with him, he would say, I don't understand why everything I say, you just have to disrespect me. And I'm like, dude, she's not disrespecting you. She's just not you. You know, that's kind of a hard stretch there, Okay. Now, this whole dynamic of can I let you be you, can I bend the knee, our sin nature makes this one a little more difficult. Am I right, Presbyterian? You know, I mean, basically what the Bible tells us is we're all born and we hold a board meeting and elect ourselves chairman, right? That's, what, that's the message of the Bible, right? Um, so we're cutting against the grain here, but it's vital. I saw a couple of years ago, and uh, the husband literally had never had anyone say no to him ever in his life. Like, growing up, he was the little prince, all right? So then he gets married to, like, a homo sapien woman who actually has a brain, and it's like he's, like, like horrified that she would, you know, like, not agree with moi, you know? Anyway, so he's, he was always throwing these little Napoleonic temper tantrums because it, she was trying to resist. So she comes to the therapy. Of course, he's not going to come to therapy. The unrepentant, jerky type people don't come to therapy. They cause their loved ones to need to come to therapy. <laughs> okay? 
So anyway, she comes to therapy, and I quickly diagnose that what's wrong with this marriage is that she's not getting to exist, and he's lacking the ability to let anyone else exist, okay? So what has to happen in this kind of marriage is not like, oh, let's get him in and do some communication training. I hear this so much. It's like people who have a spouse who's a real jerk, like, oh, well, we could never get him into therapy. Not a problem. The therapy, they're not going to come to therapy. Only repentant people come to therapy. Their therapy is going to be something else, which I'll tell you about before the break, just so none of you try to sneak out. Um, anyway, so I know the only hope for this couple is i got to teach her, like, can I exist even if he's going to have a little hissy fit? Well, she starts getting this sense of self and starts showing up, like Napoleon's not the only one in the room. And she starts speaking and being grounded and having disagreements with him. Well, that got him into therapy. <laughs> He comes with her like a couple of weeks later, you know, and he's just still like, like, what is this, you know? Um, and he was charmed with me for teaching her th these skills, of course. Um, but what it did, and this is biblical and psychological, I hope one of the things that you will learn as you hear me speak is, is he talking biblical principles or psychological ones here? Mm-hmm. Okay. What happened was when he had to encounter some of the limits set on him of another person existing and saying no to his immaturity, it forced him to have to grow. We don't make the distinction in our culture anymore about repentant versus unrepentant too much. We'll talk about this more tomorrow, but just a teaser. First, the first thing God wonders when he first meets somebody is, are you repentant or unrepentant? Are you open to being, to growing, that you're part of the problem, that you need to change, or is it all other people's stuff, okay? Now, what do repentant people need to grow? They need uh, restoration and comfort and grace and mercy and goodies, okay? What do unrepentant people need to become repentant people, okay? And if you read the Bible... The primary way in which God engages unrepentant people to help them grow is not through love them more, live out Christ to them more. They'll eat you alive. What an unrepentant person needs in order to grow is to have limits set on their immaturity. We'll talk about that some tomorrow in the conflict section. Because the conflict section, actually this whole conference is predicated on the assumption that you guys are somewhat repentant or you wouldn't be here. It's Friday night for crying out loud. You want to be home with like a beer and a steak, right? But you're listening to this goofball instead. You're obviously repentant enough to at least be interested or have given in to your spouse's nagging and gone to see John Cox. I'm hoping I'm making it as painless as possible. But with somebody who is unrepentant, I'm thinking as the therapist here, the only thing that will change an unrepentant, controlling little Napoleon like him is for his wife to learn to set limits on him. All right? It's another category that we don't usually talk about, all right? So, for us controller types, and I'm a controller type. Try that on. I'm a touchy-feely relational controller. <clears throat> don't you feel sorry for Norma? No wonder she doesn't want to travel with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> for us controller types, be reflecting how good are we at the ability to embrace our spouse being them, saying no to us, being different from us, saying, you know, I think that, you know, this, this exit's closed, you need to go in, 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 and being in the background, giving opinions to you. How good are we at that, all right? Can we, can we submit? Am I messing this up? Okay, good. How much can we submit ourselves to someone else? All right, brief corny marriage joke. Another little break. So there's this guy, and he's got an interview this morning for a new position as vice president of the bank. And he's kind of nervous, and he's getting dressed, and he's putting on his best suit, and he comes downstairs. His wife's down in the kitchen waiting on him. And he comes up to her and goes, oh, I'm kind of nervous. And she pats him on the lapels and straightens his tie. And she says, honey, don't you worry. No matter what happens in that interview today, you will always be vice president in this house. Okay. What you want? No. 
No, I got a little more. Yeah. What? Oh, we're going to break them into small groups? <laughs> you know, I, I grew up and began teaching at my church, First Presbyterian Church of Jackson, which is a big edifice, the self-proclaimed flagship of the denomination. And people there are very, like, northeast Jackson, Mississippi. And um, I would teach and ask them to interact and stuff like that, and they wouldn't. And I would say, if y'all don't, I will break you into small groups. And hands would start to go up. You know, it's all of a sudden they're ready to... Just, you know, don't, don't pull that trigger, man. All right. Now, hear me, the, hear me, you doormats, okay? Let's touch back on y'all. People who live in, like a controlling person like me, we need you to not let us control everything, okay? We need you to push back on us when we try to steamroll you. We need that for this marriage to work, okay? In other words, if this marriage is going to work, you have to exist in it. As I alluded, this is therapy for unrepentance. Ah, I'll go ahead and tell you that now. People are like, oh, well, we'll never get him to therapy. That's not what will help them. Therapy for them is not sitting in a room with a guy on a couch. Therapy isn't about sitting in a room with a guy on a couch. Therapy is about getting what I need in a relationship to grow. Therapy for unrepentant people is good, powerful limits set by you. In other words, that works because marriages are kind of like baby mobiles. Think about it. Think about a baby mobile. You know, it's got all sorts of little Noah's arcs and stuff hanging from it, right? What happens to the baby mobile if you cut one of the Noah's arcs off? The whole baby mobile will change. And some of y'all are here and you're thinking, my spouse doesn't care about this. They don't want to grow. They, don't, they think it's a bunch of psychobabble. Don't worry about it. If you do your growth, it will shift the system. It's like changing one of the gears in a clock clock will tell time different and the way we engage an unrepentant person who's like well it's my way or the highway is to the degree i learned to lovingly powerfully set limits on them they are, will be required to grow up and to change that's why this can you be you is so important that first one okay so that means when we begin a sentence by saying what are you thinking inviting them to the party okay i want you to not respond like chicken little and say, well, I thought y'all were like friends from work and stuff. You do that, and we'll treat you like that forever. I want you to say, I'm not sure if that's a question or a criticism. Which one do you think it is? I want you to say, I don't think I want to do the whole criticize my choices thing tonight. Can we do a do-over? Can we, like, push reset? Limit set on a person who can't let you be you is a vital way in which we make them grow. It's what God does, Okay. That's what this kind of relationship needs first, not more love. It's the only way to have a good marriage with an alpha or a jerk or a powder or a manipulator or whatever, okay? And this is why the stereotypical Christian response to the wife with the bully husband of to go back and submit better doesn't work, okay? Growth for a controller, growth for an alpha, growth for a, a, a difficult person, Christ-likeness for them comes from having to engage limits okay i teach this all the time at my office it's on my podcast a talk called difficult people and it is the number one by far podcast downloaded on my uh talk downloaded on my podcast it's what is the christ-like godly way to deal with having a sense of self and existing with somebody who won't let you do that okay so you see what i mean there's more to mirrors than the touchy-feely now we've gotten nasty hadn't we we're talking about the power of power to create love, not just intimacy and softness. That's part of it. But I want you to have categories for what it looks like and sounds like to exist and to engage someone who does not want you to exist, because we all do that to some degree. And we'll talk tomorrow about the sort of conflict that that will generate. But healthy conflict is good. You codependent pleasers, you heard it here first, all right? Now, if you can't do these things, cool, again, admit it. Bring it to your body of Christ, people. You can grow there. But I want you to have the categories that what we're looking at here in marriage is not, do you have a good marriage or not? Or do y'all need a getaway weekend? I want to dissect this into the pieces that humans need to do relationship. And this applies to our relationship with God, our relationship with our kids, whatever like that. All right. Now, let's take a break. Boom.